Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Roseanne Ford, president of the Mid-State Chamber of Commerce with offices here in Meriden and members throughout the region. This program was born from a recent Mid-State Chamber Health and Wellness Council meeting. The council is made up of many folks that work in the healthcare field and many business folks. And they had a lot of questions. So we quickly recognized the need for such a program to offer to our members and to our residents. So we immediately thought of our many member resources, which can help us with this session. And that brings us to our tremendous collaborative team that we have to thank today. We thank Hartford Healthcare and Mid-State Medical Center, Community Health Centers, SCOW, Spanish Community of Wallingford, our United Way of Meriden and Wallingford, Record Journal and RJ Media Group, and the State of Connecticut Department of Public Health. We'll do our very best to answer your questions today. We received many in advance and you can type your questions today in the comments area. We also thank all of you who are watching and listening today. And we will also be recording this for viewing later and we'll be sending out those links to you as well and sharing those on social media. Before I introduce our moderator, I do want to take a moment to share that this is the Mid-State Chamber's 125th year in business. We are very excited about that. We have a number of exciting programs planned, and we invite you all to join us. And if your business is not yet a member of the Mid-State Chamber, we invite you to join us. We are the link between business and community. So give us a call at 203-235-7901. Visit us at midstatechamber.com and also follow us on social media like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. It is now my true pleasure to introduce Maria Campos Harlow, Executive Director of Our United Way of Meriden and Wallingford, who will be our moderator today. Good afternoon, Maria. Good afternoon, Roseanne, and thank you. And good afternoon and welcome to all of you for joining us today. This has been a wild year and our daily routines have drastically changed. We have had to make a number of sacrifices um, during this years. In, during this year. And uh, I can confidently say that most of us are ready to gain back some type of normalcy in our lives. One way to get us there is the vaccine. It is remarkable that in one year, we're already in the process of getting vaccinated. This is a reason to feel grateful and fortunate. But understandably so, there are people in our community that still are unsure about getting the vaccine. And that's why um, this forum, uh, it, we're offering this forum today. Before we get it started, I would like to give a shout out to the amazing team that made this group together. Not only the, the list of the wonderful organizations that are participating, but also the individual. From the organizations, and I'm going to listen. I'm going to name them really quickly: Mystic Chamber of Commerce, Roseanne Ford, Community Health Center, Gary Wallace and Caroline Oliveira, Harper Healthcare and Mid State Medical Center, Lynn Faria and Rhea Smith, Record Journal and RJ Media Group, Liz White and Richie Rats Ratzak, Spanish Community Wallingford, Adriana Rodriguez. It has been. Uh, delightful working with them uh, to put together this event for all of you to get it today. Now we're going to start uh, with our presentation um, and just uh, we have just after after our guest speaker um, shares all of her information about the vaccine or during her presentation as well you guys are welcome to type your questions and then after she finishes doing her presentation, Adriana Rodriguez will be reading your questions so our guest can answer them. So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Virginia Bailock, Hartford Healthcare's Central Region Chief of Infectious Diseases, disease. So thank you, Dr. Bailock, for joining us today and welcome. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today. So you can go right ahead with, ahead with your presentation. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Yes, we can. Great. Um, I'm sort of a 
technologic novice, um, having spent much of the year taking care of COVID patients. So I'm just getting into this Zoom right now. Uh, first of all, this is, um, I'm happy to provide you with educational information, but if you need specific medical advice, uh, please contact your healthcare provider with any questions or, you, or concerns that you might have concerning your condition. But remember, if you have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911. Okay, I'm gonna start with a little bit of background about the disease COVID-19 which is caused by a virus known as SARS-CoV-2, and tell you a little bit about why we are encouraging people to get vaccinated. So infection with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, can result in a range of illness, from mild symptoms to severe illness and death. We don't know how SARS-CoV-2 will affect each individual person who becomes infected. Some people, such as those who are over the age of 65 or people with certain medical conditions, are more prone to becoming seriously ill when they contract SARS-CoV-2. However, I will tell you that recently we are seeing more younger people. We have people in their 20s who become seriously ill, requiring hospitalization, including sometimes going to the intensive care unit. And this is um, partly reflective of the, fact, of the fact that vaccines work. We are seeing very, very few elderly individuals who have SARS-CoV-2 infection now, whereas last spring, they were the majority of our patients in the hospital. So right now, the people that are getting sick with SARS-CoV-2 tend to be younger. So there are multiple COVID-19 vaccines which are in development, several of which are in large scale phase, large scale phase three trials or un, are in use under what is called an emergency use authorization. The FDA's emergency use authorization is a process that helps facilitate the availability and use of medicines and vaccines during public health emergencies, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic. So it allows the FDA to respond much more quickly when vaccines and medications are developed. Please remember though that COVID-19 vaccines are being held to the same safety standards as are all vaccines that we have used in people over the years. And there are, there are phases of vaccine investigation. And those are, um, and these, this is true for all medications, but there are phase one trials where they try to answer the question, is the vaccine safe? Phase two trials, what are the most common short-term side effects? What is the body's immune response? Are there signs that the vaccine is going to be um, effective? And then if the answers to the phase one and phase two trials are favorable, the pharmaceutical companies will launch the phase three trials, which are, are really what the FDA uses to authorize use under the emergency use authorization. And then after the vaccines are being used, the FDA, the CDC are still looking for data on safety and efficacy of these vaccines. So it's a very rigorous process. It's the same process that other vaccines have gone through. Currently in the United States, three vaccines have an emergency use authorization from the FDA. The first is the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, which is two doses given at least 21 days apart. The Moderna vaccine, which is two doses given at least 28 days apart. And the Janssen vaccine, which is a single dose vaccination. As you're gonna see as I go on, all of these vaccines have been tested in tens of thousands of adults from diverse backgrounds, including older adults and communities of color. All of these pharmaceutical companies have done their best to really have a varied patient population that is being studied for these vaccines. 
it is true we don't know how long these vaccines will how how long protection from the vaccines will last and there's a simple answer to the questions we don't have patients who have been vaccinated long enough ago to help us answer those questions. But we do know that scientists at the pharmaceutical companies and other scientists are looking to find the answer to these questions. Pfizer now has enough patients who have been vaccinated six months out to say that they believe that their vaccine will protection will last at least six months. The answer to this question is going to come. We just all need to be patient for these answers. Now, in order to understand the current vaccines, you need to understand a little bit about the virus and what is the target of, these va uh, of the vaccines. And the target are these red knobs on the virus, which are known as the spike protein. Scientists have recognized very early on that the first step in the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus affecting humans, is that these little red knobs stick to cells in um, our nasopharynx or, or our nose or the back part of our nose. So these little red spikes known, known as the spike protein are key to the virus hanging onto our cells and initiating infection. So scientists theorize, what if we block this binding? What if we, we cause this protein to not effectively bind to the cells in our nose? Will that be protective? And lo and behold, they identified that yes, if you can block this binding, you help patients avoid infection. And therefore, all of the current vaccines are aimed at blocking this protein on the virus from attaching to our cells. So the first two COVID vaccines which became available are known as mRNA vaccines. And these vaccines contain the code for our cells to make this spike protein. So the vaccines teach our cells how to make this harmless piece of the spike protein for SARS-CoV-2. After this, uh, after this protein is made by our cells, our cells break down the instruction or the mRNA and get rid of it. But meanwhile, our cells have made spike protein and they put this spike protein on the surface of our cells. And our immune system says, hmm, that's not part of us. And so our immune system is triggered to um, make what's called antibodies to this spike protein. And that, again, those antibodies will protect us from getting infected by SARS-CoV-2 in the future. There's no live COVID-19 virus in our cells as a result of this vaccine. And these mRNA vaccines do not affect or interact with our DNA in any way. Again, they're teaching our cells to make only the spike protein. Our immune system recognizes the spike protein as not part of our, our bodies and so triggers an immune response to get rid of spike protein. So the next time the, our body sees the spike protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, our, our body say, mm -mm, don't like it. And, they, and by, the antibody will bind to this virus and protect us from getting infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So let's look at the trials upon which this emergency use authorization was made for each of these virus vaccines. The first was the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And BioNTech is a German company that actually came up with this vaccine. They enrolled almost 44,000 people at 100 clinical sites, 39 United States. And uh, the slide shows you the breakdown of the ethnicity and some of the age groups that were studied in this study. Similarly, Moderna enrolled 30,000 people, 89 clinical sites, 32 states. Again, um, they went out specifically to look for as broad a racial, ethnic, and age grouping as that they could find for their studies. And both of them had a number of patients who were in the older age group. And again, if you remember, 
older individuals are more likely to become infected with SARS-CoV-2. So lots of people studied. Since these studies, remember, millions of patients of people have received these vaccines. So again, the Pfizer study, uh, half the people got placebo and half of them got vaccine. <clears throat> there were eight cases of COVID-19 in vaccinated recipients and 162 cases in those who received placebo. This was statistically significant and allowed the company to say that the Pfizer vaccine was 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 infection. And so on December 11th, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization for individuals that should be 16 years, I apologize, 16 years of age and older to receive this vaccine. The Moderna vaccine, 94% effective in preventing symptomatic infection. Older individuals had a little less protection, but still way above what the FDA was willing to consider effective for a vaccine. And it's important to notice with both vaccine that all participants who got severe disease were in the placebo group. That is, they did not get vaccine. So both of these vaccines, very effective in preventing severe illness in patients. So like most vaccines that people receive, these COVID vaccines are expected to produce some side effects after vaccination, especially after the second dose. These side effects may include a little bit of fever, some headache, muscle aches, but the clinical trials did not identify any significant safety concerns with either of these mRNA vaccines. And it, the companies waited at least eight weeks after most people were vaccinated before they released their data. And the reason for that is because most serious side effects from vaccinations occur within eight weeks after administration of the vaccine. And then again, in that eight week period of time, these companies did not identify any serious safety effects in these vaccines. Again, both of these vaccines have been administered to millions of people with no significant side effects identified. And again, we're going to go over how do we know this, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. The latest vaccine is the Janssen vaccine. It's often known as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Janssen is actually the part of Johnson & Johnson that manufactures vaccines. And that consists of a harmless adenovirus that cannot make you sick, which transports the same code for the spike protein into our cells. Adenoviruses cause the common cold. <clears throat> this, however, this adenovirus it cannot make us sick because it cannot replicate once, in get, once it gets inside of us. So it's similar to vi viruses that can cause a cold, but it cannot copy itself inside of us, so it cannot make us sick. The company studied, again, almost 40, 44,000 participants in a randomized placebo-controlled study in the United States, as well as in South Africa and South America, Mexico, and the United States. And the fact that there are um, patients who were studied in South Africa and South America is key in this study because we know that some of the variants that we're starting to see in this country were um, spreading throughout both South America and Africa, South Africa. And so this vaccine was the only one that was actually tested under these um, more harsh conditions of some of these variants. Again, half the patients got vaccine, half got placebo. It's a one-dose shot. These patients were, again, followed for eight weeks after vaccination to identify any serious safety concerns. And again, most of the serious safety concerns are obvious eight weeks after any vaccination. 
patients did get some side effects. They would get some pain at the injection site, some headache, fatigue, muscle aches, nausea. But again, these side effects go away within a day or two and really pale in comparison to what can happen if you get SARS-CoV-2. This vaccine prevented severe and critical COVID-19 in 77% of patients starting at 14 days after vaccine and at 28 days was 85% effective in preventing infection that was classified as severe or critical. At prevention of less severe disease or moderate disease, the vaccine was 66% effective in preventing moderate to severe COVID-19 28 days after vaccination. Again, this vaccine afforded complete protection against COVID-19 related hospitalization and death in patients who received the vaccine. And this vaccine is approved for patients age 18 and older. So again, I wanna point out again that this vaccine uh, was studied a little bit later in the United States when we had more of the variants of concern circulating and was actually studied in uh, some challenging geographic locations such as South Africa and Brazil, where we know there are a lot of variants of concern. And in, in some of these areas, the predominant vaccine, the va predominant virus that was spreading were these variants of concern. And yet this vaccine was found to be significantly effective in these uh, patients. Please remember that there is no vaccine there is no non-COVID vaccine that is 100% effective. These vaccines are very effective, and um, but nothing is going to be 100% effective ever. So I know you're all concerned about how fast these vaccines were developed. And honestly, if you had asked me a year ago, would we have a vaccine in a year, I probably would have said mm, maybe 18 months. And this is really a tribute to modern science. <clears throat> so how did we get these vaccines so fast? So the pharmaceutical companies uh, do studies all the time. So they already have existing networks to conduct vaccine trials. So they reached out to those investigators and said, do you want to be part of our trial? So they didn't have to sign up new investigators. They were working with people that they had worked with before. The pharmaceutical companies also began manufacturing vaccine while the clinical trials were still underway. Usually, a company will not spend money to manufacture a vaccine until um, after they have their data that the vaccine is effective because they don't want to spend millions of dollars making something that might not work. Because of the pandemic, the vaccine company said, we're going to start manufacturing these vaccines right away. Even though we don't know if they'll work, we might have to discard this, but we're going to make the commitment up front. mRNA vaccines, such as the first two vaccines, are actually quite quick to produce and they're faster to produce than a traditional vaccine. Um, there has been substantial experience with adenovirus-based vaccines over the years, and that's the Janssen vaccine. And um, that's, that's very similar to the Ebola vaccine that is widely used in Africa and has been given to hundreds of thousands of people. So they, they knew that this concept would work. As the FDA and the CDC are prioritizing review and authorization of these vaccines. They're not waiting a month, two months, three months to schedule their advisory committee meetings. As soon as the data are um, submitted, the advisory committee is called into action to make a decision. And the, the most important thing, I think, is that there's a lot of COVID-19 infection around so that they were able to find cases quickly. If you think about it, there's very little measles in the United States. Suppose a company wanted to make a measles vaccine. It would take them years to accumulate enough cases of measles to say whether or not their vaccine was effective. Because of the widespread um, 
pandemic that we're seeing, there were a lot of cases. So the placebo, they, they accumulated enough cases, mostly in the placebo recipients within a short period of time for the statisticians to look and say, yes, this vac these vaccines are effective. So there are a lot of reasons why we were able to get these vaccines so quickly. Safety. The, the FDA, the CDC are really, really, really looking for people to report anything that they think could be related to the vaccine. And I would encourage anybody who um, gets a, a vaccine to sign up for VSAFE. You download the app on the phone, the CDC questions you um, initially frequently, but then less frequently for a number of weeks after you got the vaccine about what you are experiencing. It, it makes you um, an honorary researcher to help collect data about these vaccines. So I would encourage everybody who gets a vaccine to sign up with VSAFE. They want to know what's going on with this vaccine. The other system is the Vayers vaccine or the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. That's an online reporting system. If you think, if you got a vaccine and something happened to you four weeks later, go to that system and report it. Does it mean that, that the vaccine caused that, what, that illness? But if, they, if the CDC doesn't hear about what people think might be related to vaccines, they will never know. And so um, if one person reports a, what they think is a side effect, the CDC will look at it and say, mm, probably not related. If they're getting hundreds of people reporting something that they think might be vaccine related, they're going to investigate. So again, I, I urge you all to be a part of this investigation after the vaccines, because the CDC, the FDA, they want to know what's going on after vaccination. So please avail yourself of all these reporting systems. Okay. So I borrowed these slides from Dr. Roy, um, who, and I, I thank him for this because he recently participated with me on a, um, a webinar about it, infertility and the vaccines, because that's a, been a big question. So has pregnancy. Can I get the vaccine if I'm pregnant? So I'm going to spend a few minutes on pregnancy and infertility. Um, we know that COVID-19 infections in pregnancy are more dangerous than in non-pregnant individuals. They get, pregnant women get more severe illness than a non-pregnant woman. Infected patients are five times more likely to end up in the intensive care unit if they are pregnant. They are more likely to need mechanical ventilation. Um, they're more likely to have symptomatic disease. And your outcome is worse if your pregnancy is complicated by obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. And you're, you have a risk, a higher risk of preterm birth if you develop COVID-19 while you are pregnant. So COVID-19 in pregnancy is a more severe disease and can potentially put your baby at risk of preterm delivery. The CDC lists pregnancy as a condition that is a high-risk medical condition for COVID-19. Okay. So what about COVID-19 vaccines in pregnancy? They were not studied in pregnant women, although the Moderna vaccine was studied in pregnant mice. This slide is a little bit out of date, but at the time it was written, over 30,000 pregnant women have taken the vaccine 1,800 have been studied, and there's no difference in side effects, no increase in birth defects, no increase in miscarriage. And I know um, the number I heard was that this was weeks ago that 15,000 pregnant women had participated in the VSAFE program. That is, they got their vaccine, they downloaded their app, and there were no um, adverse outcomes that had been noted. Again, um, very important if you're pregnant and you get the vaccine, please um, download the VSAPE app. You know, we need to keep, we need to get data. 
So studies are ongoing currently, and there have been no changes in vaccine recommendations for pregnant women. And again, utilize the reporting systems if you do get the vaccine when you are pregnant. Supporters of vaccinating pregnant women, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, CDC, FDA, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, American Society for Reproductive Medicine, American Association of Pediatrics, WHO, all support vaccination of pregnant women. So how, what do you consider um, if you're pregnant and you want to get think about getting vaccinated? Okay, risks of disease to the patient. You know, you're a pregnant woman, you're at more uh, risk of getting um, infected. What's the level of activity in the community? And I'm sure all of you have read that SARS-CoV-2 infection um, is seems to be increasing in the state of Connecticut. Um, the vaccines are very efficacious. Again, uh, safety, we think these vaccines are safe. Can I tell you with 100% certainty? No, but the data currently look like the vaccines are safe. Um, and what trimester you're in, you want to talk to your um, gynecologist, your obstetrician about this. So if you are pregnant, talk to your doctor. Um, the technology used to develop these vaccines is not new. There are ongoing studies of the vaccine in pregnant women. Uh, this vaccine cannot change your DNA, nor can it change the, the DNA of your baby. And the good news that we've learned only in recent weeks is that if you're pregnant um, in pregnancy, sorry, if you're pregnant and you get the vaccine and the, you have enough time to develop antibody, that's about four weeks, these antibodies will cross the placenta, go to your baby, and when your baby is born, your baby may well have some protection against getting SARS-CoV-2. So that's a good thing. Again, it's not the vaccine that is going across the placenta, it's the protection with antibody that your body has made. Um, there's no reason to believe that the vaccine will affect the safety of breast milk. It does not contain virus, so there's no risk to your baby if you're breastfeeding. Um, the mRNA breaks down. Your baby may get some antibody in breast milk, and that, again, is a good thing to protect your baby. Uh, no reason to pump and dump your breast milk if you're vaccinated. And COVID-19 vaccine should be offered to lactating women, similar to non-lactating women. Again, there's been a lot out on social media about infertility and the COVID vaccines. Um, and this, the, um, uh, there was some information put out there that the mRNA vaccines make spike protein that is similar to a protein on the placenta and that the ingredients in the GlaxoSmithKline vaccine, of which there is no GlaxoSmithKline vaccine, I used an adjuvant that could affect H, um, gonadotropin release hormone and thus um, affect fertility. Again, these are two rumors that are out there. So the attachment protein and the spike protein of coronavirus is not that similar to the placental protein. <clears throat> These are large proteins made up of lots of amino acids and the spike protein on coronavirus uh, shares four amino acids, which is a very, 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 very tiny um, sharing of uh, similarity to the placental protein. So this, you do not, this is not large enough for your body to make an immune response to your placenta. I can tell you that women who have had COVID-19 have had exposure to the same spike protein have become pregnant after getting infected with the virus. And so therefore there is no um, and no effect of either having COVID-19 or getting vaccine on the spike protein. And there are nothing in any of the adjuvants or ingredients of any of these vaccines that can affect your hormones and thus affect your ability to get pregnant. So um, ACOG, 
uh, Association of Reproductive Clinical Services all say there is no reason not to get um, vaccinated. You might want to time your egg retrieval or insemination around the vaccine in case you get a vaccine, a fever related to that, which will um, in case, which could be confused with any sort of infection that develops. So again, these vaccines help you create an immune response to your body against the virus. Make, even if you get infected, it may keep you from getting severely ill. And we're getting more data that by you getting vaccinated, you will protect your relatives, your family, your friends from getting COVID-19. Um, getting COVID-19 causes some degree of immunity, but you get a much better immune response to getting the vaccine. And it's a much safer way to uh, protect yourselves and your family members. So wh while you're waiting for vaccine, uh, please use the public health measures that we've been implicated. We've been asking you to use for months cover your nose and mouth with a mask, avoid close contact, maintain social distancing, clean and disinfect, and wash your hands. Um, I can't tell you how many people while waiting to get fully vaccinated have come down with COVID-19. So please stay safe and get vaccinated when it's your turn. And I thank you all for your attention and I'd like to entertain any questions you have right now. Dr. Bailey, thank you for this absolutely wonderful presentation. You touched so many points. You answered so many of my questions. Um, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, Adriana, do we have any questions that um, our guests are, want to know? Yes. The first question, if I tested positive for the COVID-19, do you still need to get the vaccine? Very good question, yes. Um, we know from the studies available thus far that you get a much better immune response to the vaccine than your body did to having had natural infection. So once you're out of your isolation period, which is either 10 days or 20 days, depending on your immune system, you should go ahead and schedule your COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. You. Second question, how long is the vaccine for? Will we need to get the vaccine yearly? Another very good question. Unfortunately, we don't know the answer to that yet. And it's really a two-part answer. Um, remember that these vaccines haven't been along, around that long. Companies are uh, studying how long vaccine protection lasts. Pfizer came out with something recently that their protection will last at least six months. And why can't we tell you longer than six months? Because nobody's been vaccinated for longer than six months. But they can't believe you, everybody wants to know the answer to that question. The other issue that's going to come into play are the variants. As you can see in the study from Janssen and there are data from Pfizer and Moderna that these vaccines may be less effective against some of the newer strains of the virus or the, what are called the variants of concern. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that the, you may need a booster to help you um, overcome some of these variants. Now, again, these vaccines all have some efficacy, but you may need a booster that has slightly different spike protein in it to help you fight off these variants. So um, more data to come. Again, data are going to come out on a weekly basis, and um, it's really important to, to just um, speak with your healthcare provider about what are the changes. But for right now, all we're recommending is one vaccine, either two shots of Moderna or Pfizer, or one shot of the Janssen vaccine. Thank you. You did tap into my next question, and it's kind of asking again, will booster vaccines be necessary? Again, I think um, I think there's a very good chance they will be necessary, and um, but I think we just need and need to wait and see. One thing I'd like to say about the variants we've heard about, 
the way to overcome these variants is to get as many people vaccinated as soon as possible, because when you give the virus a host that has no immunity to, um, to replicate in, that's how it's going to make mistakes and make new variants. And we don't want to give the virus the opportunity to do that. So please get vaccinated. Thank you. I have Bell's palsy with my first vaccine. Would you get the second vaccine? Um, uh, I, I, um, I, you know, I'd have to know you. I think um, the recommendation is you have to understand how uh, serious COVID-19 can be. And with your first vaccine, you got some protection, but again, it was studied as a two dose. If you got the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, it was studied as a two dose vaccine. Um, and we don't know yet whether the Bell's palsy was definitively related to the vaccine. Again, all of these these things that you think could be related need to be reported to um, the CDC through one of the mechanisms, because only by doing that are we going to get the data of whether or not it's truly related. In the Pfizer study, um, more there were 14 cases of Bell's palsy in the vaccinated group and 10 in the non-vaccinated in the placebo group. And that was not felt to be statistically significant. Again, you had 10 people in the placebo group who got Bell's palsy and they didn't get the vaccine. So that the FDA said, well, this is what happened in the Pfizer vaccine is not outside of what we expect um, normal numbers to have been given that many people over that time period. So they never definitively proved that the, that the Bell's palsy was related to the vaccine. So, but they need these data. They do need these data. So I think you need to talk to your healthcare provider um, about your risk of COVID-19. But I think if at all possible, we would recommend getting the second shot of the vaccine to get the protection that was studied. Thank you. We hear of side effects within 24 hours of the vaccine, but can one experience side effects a week or two after the vaccine? Good question and something that's come up since the original data. Um, not usually, although with Moderna vaccine, there are some people who get a red arm that can occur seven to 10 days afterwards. And interestingly, if it occurs with your first vaccine, it doesn't mean it's going to occur with your second vaccine. But, you know, the people I've seen have had no other symptoms other than they did get a red arm, and that's been well described. But for the most part, no. And again, serious side effects usually occur within eight weeks after a vaccine. And thus far, we haven't seen any uh, signal <clears throat> that there are serious side effects from these vaccines that are long-term and millions of people have been vaccinated. But again, please, we need the data. Help us gather the data and um, uh, participate in the vSafe program. And if you have something, even if you're not sure, report it to the VAERS system online. Because again, the CDC is only going to know this if enough people report it and they can determine that the incidence of condition X is higher in vaccine recipients than in non-vaccine recipients. Thank you. Is there any data or analysis on the placebo testing? <clears throat> placebo, um, they wouldn't, you know, they, they know that more cases occur in placebo. You got to understand that in the in the at least in the mRNA trials, I think placebo was just some normal saline, so it's not going to cause any. It should not cause any effect um, on your body, but it's interestingly in the in the Janssen um, trial, 0.3 percent of placebo recipients had things like itching and um, a rash and 0.4% of vaccine recipients had it. So it, it's not even clear that 
what happened in the vaccine recipients was all due to the vaccine. So placebo should do nothing either, either to your immune system or cause reactions, but they have to study reactions in the placebo recipients to, turn, to determine whether or not what happened in the vaccine recipients was, was truly due to the vaccine. Thank you. Will I have more serious side effects from the vaccine if I recently recovered from the COVID-19 virus? Good question. Um, I, I, some people feel that yes, that, and and there are you know there's some signal that yes, uh, you might have more. Um, I, I don't want to use the word severe, but more prominent symptoms uh, because the first of all, you're not more likely to have anaphylaxis or one of those early side effects that we look for in the first 15 minutes, but you might have some more fever or some more achiness. Um, but again, these are, are short-lived side effects, and within a day or two, you should be feeling better. Thank but you. Don't, let that, don't let that scare you from getting a vaccine, please. Thank you. Please explain what the Bell's palsy means. Uh, good question. Um, Bell's palsy is a condition that's not uncommon that occurs in people who are can be otherwise healthy where your the nerve to the muscles of your face is affected and your face it doesn't move symmetrically. In most cases, it, you recover. We know that Bell's palsy, for example, is something that we see in Lyme disease. It can be seen in secondary to herpes type infections, and it can be what we call idiopathic in that we don't know what caused it, but it's um, a not uncommon condition. And so in the vaccine trial, it occurred in both placebo recipients as well as vaccine recipients. And the number in the vaccine recipients did not seem to be anything out of the ordinary, which one would have expected related to just being alive or you know, idiopathic Bell's palsy or HSV or whatever. So it, Thus far, it, you know, it's not clear how much of an impact vaccine has on Bell's palsy. So um, please, um, you know, talk to your healthcare provider if you're concerned about Bell's palsy. Um, but, you know, we need people, again, to report side effects of the vaccine. Thank you. What vaccine is better? Okay, <laughs> the best vaccine for you is the one that you can get. Um, again, there's no head-to-head -head comparison of Pfizer versus Moderna versus Janssen vaccine. <clears throat> the studies are all designed slightly differently. The question, um, the um, patient population um, that was considered to have um, COVID differed slightly. The vaccines were studied at different time points. Pfizer and Moderna were studied before we had a lot of the variants of concern in the United States. Janssen did their vaccine trial in parts of the world that were more challenging because they had more variants. So right now, um, the, one, the vaccine that's best for you is the one you can get. Some people really wanna get an only a one dose vaccine. Uh, the, so there are some clinics that will offer only the Janssen vaccine. Uh, with the Janssen vaccine, you're protected. You have full protection two weeks after getting that first shot of vaccine. With the other two vaccines, it's two weeks after the second shot. So it really is, it's what you can get because we have no head-to-head -head comparisons of any of these vaccines. Thank you. When will we know more information on vaccinations for those 15 and younger? Great question. Um, <laughs> Pfizer has data already on um, 
children 11 to 15. And again, I apologize for the typo in my slide. Pfizer is recommended for people 16 and above because it was studied 16 and above. Janssen and Moderna 18 and above because that's who it was studied in. Uh, Pfizer now has data for children 11 to 15 that suggest efficacy because we know the virus, uh, sorry, the vaccine from Pfizer is effective, it should not be long before um, they go for an EUA for the age group of 11 to 15. Moderna has decided that it's going to look at younger children, age 11 and younger, because Pfizer is already studying ages 11 to 15. So in order for us to get um, approval. It makes a lot of sense that one pharmaceutical company is looking at one age group and the other is going to focus on the other age group. So I think the Pfizer data on 11 to 15 is going to be out within uh, a number of months and we'll probably get approval for those children. And that's great news because we know that as the children get older, they tend to get um, they tend to spread more and they tend to get a little sicker. So I think it's really exciting and I'm hope I'm hopeful that by the early next school year, the, the children will be vaccinated. Great news. Yeah. Have you seen a high percentage of side effects with any of these vaccines? Um, you know, I, I personally, I don't see them. Um, I can tell you um, personal experience and what I know from my colleagues and friends and relatives that have gotten them. Most people, you know, just go about their daily activities the next day, next two days um, without any problems. A few people after, especially after their second dose of the uh, mRNA vaccines can feel unwell for a day or two and, and maybe not be able to work. But the vast majority of my colleagues, um, my relatives, my um, young nieces, my young nephews, I mean, are getting it, my daughter, um, it, it really didn't affect them all that much. And, and you know, the CDC says don't take Tylenol or ibuprofen before you get the vaccine, but once you get a side effect, take some Tylenol for your headache. It's going to go away. And again, uh, you know, I think um, there's been a lot of talk about the side effects, but you know, I've got to tell you, it, it's very sad to have a young person admitted to the hospital with COVID. And COVID, the symptoms of COVID can be far worse. Uh, than the side effects of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I really haven't even touched on what's called long COVID. And many people, even if they had mild COVID, don't feel well for months afterwards. And it really can impact your daily um, existence if you get long COVID. Mm -hmm. So really, um, you know, we're trying to, to get everybody vaccinated. So don't let the side effects scare you. The other thing I'd like to say is there are increasing reports of people who have had long COVID who get the vaccine and they feel better. And, um, oh. you know, it doesn't, it, I've heard it from a lot of doctors, you know, a lot of my colleagues on our listservs are saying that they're seeing these um, people who are feeling better after getting vaccinated. We don't have data on it, but if you have long COVID, don't let it scare you out of getting the vaccine. Thank you. Can we travel if we are vaccinated? Oh, great question. <laughs> yes. Um, about a week ago now, the CDC came out and said that you're at low risk if you are fully vaccinated. Again, that's two weeks after your second shot of the mRNA vaccine or two weeks after the Janssen vaccine. When you travel, though, um, you, you still have to be careful. You still have to wear your mask, social distance um, whenever you can. Um, stay in well ventilated areas. And when you get at your destination, you know, if best if you socialize with people who are fully vaccinated and socialize with people um, outdoors to the extent possible. But I think um, it's one of the things I, I got to tell you, I was really happy to hear the CDC say that. Um, so travel, but travel safely. Okay. And it just, you know, I know a lot of people are looking forward to seeing grandchildren and relatives and all that. And this is all really good news. You're not at no risk if you travel, but you are at low risk.
Very exciting news yeah. about traveling. <laughs> yeah, that made me really happy. <laughs> Definitely. Can you explain what long COVID is a little more? Sure, sorry. Um, a, a number of people who have had COVID-19, either mild or severe disease, have symptoms that persist for months. And the symptoms are varied. Um, they can be um, insomnia, brain fog that people describe, shortness of breath, fatigue. Um, and it doesn't matter, you can get these symptoms even if you had mild COVID. And we're still studying these patients. Um, there are doctors who are interested in seeing these patients. Hartford HealthCare has a COVID recovery center. But even if you had mild COVID um, and you know you stayed home, you know for your time of isolation, you may have had some fever, a little bit of cough. You, your symptoms can persist for months. Now, in many patients, they do get better after three to six months, but this has had significant impact on some people's ability to function. So um, getting COVID is not good. And again, the, the side of any side effects of the vaccine are, are likely to pale in comparison to what you might experience with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Okay. Thank you. So I have one more question on my end. Sure. Um, do you recommend traveling internationally? Is it safe for our family members in other countries? A good point. Um, I, sh I should have said that CDC really talks about safe domestic travel. I think there's so much going on in other parts of the world that are having difficulty um, overcoming SARS-CoV-2 that, and, and you know, there's um, increase in Europe and they've had um, a lot more difficulty getting people vaccinated. So, um, I, I still would not recommend international travel at this point. And if you do travel internationally, there are testing requirements uh, both at this end as well as likely where you're going. So I think we need to get more people vaccinated throughout the world before international travel becomes safe. So I, I thank you for asking that clarifying question. Okay, I have one last question popped up. Could there be a specific reason why the vaccine has side effects for younger individuals rather than older? Yeah, another really uh, great <laughs> question. Um, you know, it, it probably has to do with the fact that young people are blessed with a more robust immune system. And, and as we age, our immune system uh, tends not to uh, function as robustly in some cases. Please remember, though, older individuals were studied in this tri these trials, and older individuals respond adequately to this vaccine. But um, you youngsters are, are just are, are, are blessed with your immune system. And your immune system is saying, you know what, I don't like this spike protein, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to muster our, all the defenses I can to make sure that the spike protein in the future will never cause me any problems. Thank you so much. And Maria, I'll pass it to you. I just, I have a couple more questions, Dr. Badlock. I'm just, this is fascinating. And I have been reading a lot about the vaccine and I'm still learning so much from you. And definitely I was one of those that was on the fence about getting the vaccine because there are so many questions, um, but the answers, and, and the, the end result is much better than not getting the vaccine. What can you share about people with allergies? There, is, there, there has been a questions about people, for people who have allergies to, to, to medicine, but also allergies, food allergies. Okay. Um, for the most part, food allergies shouldn't be an issue. The concern with the mRNA vaccines was people who have had prior histories of anaphylactic type of reactions and carry EpiPens, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> that was really an issue with the mRNA vaccines. And, and I don't wanna make it sound like a huge issue, but if you're gonna have a, a serious reaction, those are the people who are predisposed. Any facility 
first of all, tell the people at the facility that you're going to get your vaccine, that you've had such a reaction. Discuss it with them. The CDC requires that any facility that is administering these vaccines be prepared to handle any of these immediate type reactions. They will um, monitor you for either 15 or 30 minutes, depending on your history, 30 minutes if they're concerned about something in your history. They all have to have the epicates there. They have to have personnel trained to um, administer this. They have to have a way of getting you to um, more sophisticated care, such as a hospital. So they must be prepared to handle these reactions. If you're concerned, these reactions are less of a concern with the Janssen vaccine, and you might want to look for a center that is giving you the Janssen vaccine. You will be required to remain you know, for observation after that. But again, uh, don't let these um, uh, scare you away. Millions of vaccines have been administered. I can tell you at Hartford Healthcare, the, the staff at the vaccine clinics have had you know, tremendous experience administering these vaccines. Um, and, and so you shouldn't let that cause, cause fear in you. Even your local pharmacy has to be prepared to handle any emergencies that will come up. Thank you. At the beginning of your presentation, you spoke a little bit about how younger people are getting sick. Kurt, would you please expand a little bit on that? Sure, um, I will. Um, it's been really um, gratifying to us who work in the hospitals to see the number of elderly individuals um, decrease with COVID. And that's really a tribute to what the state of Connecticut did in terms of getting out there and vaccinating um, elderly people. I saw something that over 80% of elderly people have received um, vaccination. And so they're, they're not getting as sick enough. They may be getting mildly ill, but they're not getting sick enough to get admitted to the hospital. And when these elderly people get admitted to the hospital, they do worse. Um, younger people are getting sick. Again, <clears throat> people in their 20s, 30s, 40s are getting hospitalized, some of them going to the critical care unit and, and some of them being intubated. And that's partly a function of the fact that the we've only opened up vaccine to younger individuals in recent weeks, so they haven't had the opportunity to get vaccinated. And we are seeing increased numbers of the variant, particularly the B117 variant that is um, that spreads more readily and probably causes more severe disease. So it's looking for unvaccinated individuals to infect and they're getting sick. And you know, I, I the state of Connecticut has done an outstanding job in in terms of getting people vaccinated. And I'm really happy to see that um, younger people um, are, are getting vaccinated. I can tell you my own relatives, uh, they were, um, they're excited to have their vaccines. And, um, and so I think it's just, you know, just get back, it's hard. You know, it is frustrating. Um, my colleagues are looking for vaccines for their uh, 18 year olds. And it's frustrating. And they're on the computer on the various websites, refreshing and refreshing and refreshing. Um, vaccine becomes available all the time. Supplies um, are not, you know, they're not set weeks in advance. And so you, you just have to, keep, and people cancel appointments. So just keep um, refreshing or calling or whatever, because you will get vaccinated. It's going to be there and stay safe in the meantime, though. And uh, what about children has been, uh, my, my understanding is that it's, it's not that serious on the younger uh, children. 
but what about how can they transmit the disease? Would you please expand a little bit more? Good point. Children can transmit the disease and um, can, in rare instances, get seriously ill and can develop long COVID, which can impact their ability to do sports and their ability uh, to function in school. So, you know, it's much less common that they're going to get sick, but they can get sick. Uh, again, I think the, the schools have done an outstanding job of managing children, getting children back to school. Uh, I'm just so happy that teachers got vaccinated because I think it was very important to get our children back to school. Um, that many of them missed a, a very important year in their lives of socializing. And, you know, a lot of children have trouble focusing online. So um, masks are important. Schools are doing an outstanding job. And um, I'm really encouraged because I, it, I think the, we're going to know about safety and efficacy in children very soon because we already know these vaccines are effective in adults. And so it, it, the pharmaceutical companies have less work to do to get these vaccines out to children. And, and I'm not real familiar with the process, but I know um, that it, it, it'll, it'll happen sooner for children because we have so much data in adults. Thank you. Adriana, do you have another question? Yes. What are the death rates for each age group? Uh, you know what? I, I'd have to look those up. Um, it, and it varies over time. It is certainly the death rate is higher in older individuals, but I can tell you um, I just don't have them on the tip of my tongue, but I can tell you that now we've gained a lot of experience in the last year. Mm -hmm. So even though um, the death rate is higher in older individuals, it's less than it was, um, say, last March or April when we um, were first starting to treat patients with this disease. We have I, I've learned more over the last year than I, I have since I was an intern many years ago, and the, the, the news is changing. So again, in the younger individuals, the death rate is going to be lower, but I've personally seen people in their 30s um, pass away from this disease and uh, read about it in the newspaper. So, you know, it's less, but it is not zero. And again, over time, we've become more skilled at handling patients with this disease. Dr. Bailok, thank you so much for all the work that you do. Thank you to your colleagues, all your colleagues in the medical community. This has been an incredible year for all of us, but you guys have been doing a remarkable job to keep welcome. us safe. You are I, welcome. <laughs> and we feel, I mean, we, we're so fortunate, we, we, we're so privileged to live in this country, to have the vaccine, to, to be able to, vaccine, to, to vaccinate people so quick. Um, I think that with the right amount of information, people will be making an informed decision and we can get out of this situation quicker. So thank you so much for your well, time. Very welcome. <laughs> Um, I will not, unless anybody has any more questions, I don't want to take any more of your time. Uh, again, thank you so much for your, for all of this information and for the work that you do. Again. Adriana, do you have a question or? Yes. So following the presentation, we will be sharing an information sheet and I'll share it really quickly with everyone where you will have access to where you could schedule an appointment, where you could call. So let me present it really quick. Here we go. So we will be sharing it on all our social media pages and on our websites. And please visit the record journal um, for more information and news you could use. And as Dr. Bailot was saying, we just have to be a little patient. There are so many places where people can get the vaccine. It's a matter of the availability of the vaccine. And every time we keep getting more, so people will be able um, to make their appointments easier, faster, hopefully. <laughs> um, also, they are for information about the most updated um, guidelines in the state of Connecticut, we uh, invite you to visit the state of Connecticut website is www.ct.gov slash COVID vaccine. 
is another way to get also the latest information about guidelines. And um, I think that we, our presentation has come to an end. I just want to thank all of you uh, for joining us. Our amazing presenter, Dr. Bailot, you have been absolutely extraordinary. Roseanne, you brought us together here. Richie and the Record Journal have done an amazing job in making all of this possible. Adriana Rodriguez, we are going to be hosting next week the same forum in Spanish uh, for the Spanish speaking community. And I'm hoping that even my father from Colombia will be joining that one. <laughs> and uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, have a, a, a great rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>